Bears kid tweeted that you told him you um, <laughs> have a broken thumb. Have you ever played with a broken thumb before this year? Uh, no, broken index finger, pinkies. Uh, but no. It's, was surgery ever considered? No, I don't think so. Just it's not like Dak or those guys. It's not as severe. I, I don't know what they had, but it probably wasn't. No. Yeah. I know you never use this as an excuse. I mean, you've mentioned it basically every week, but at the same time, I would guess throwing a football with a broken thumb is probably not the easiest thing in the world. It's how big of a challenge that's at that time. Well, I think I've had worse injuries I've played with. Uh, so, you know, definitely a challenge, but the days off uh, helped feeling better this week. Any worse, though, that directly affects how the ball comes out, though? Say, Any uh, and those other injuries, were they, they didn't affect how much the ball came uh, out. Though, well, I mean, uh, you know, when I hurt my knee in 18, that was, you know, you throw from the ground up, so that was definitely uh, difficult on the footwork and uh, plant leg. But, uh, yeah, I mean, when I broke my index finger in college, that was... Uh, probably a slightly, slightly more important finger uh, to deal with. But uh, remember, as I practiced, and Coach Tedford said, "I don't, I don't care what's hurting. Uh, you got one day off, and if you miss another day of practice, you're the backup again. So there was no choice." <laughs> when, when hit, when 53 hit you from behind in the Giants game, uh, did you know if it hit a helmet or the ground? Or I mean, I know it was a big hit. Yeah, I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, just know on the flight home, I was in some pain and uh, actually didn't even, you know, want to get X-ray because I was, you know, still going to play. It didn't matter what the X-ray showed, but uh, they talked me into it. So, is this something that might need to get fixed after this? I don't think so. No. So, just to clarify, were you, to your knowledge, was it ever broken this season? Is that a, is that a, that's a real question? After everything that was just said. Well, he asked if he was. Well, you mentioned past ones. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding correctly. Yeah, I think you understand it correctly. So you you mentioned rehab a bunch of times. How do you rehab something that's broken? It's a good question. They got a lot of different machines in there, though, Bill. You'd be surprised. Um, so that's just any of the modalities in there, and it's a lot of grip stuff. So, but I, you know, like I said, the five days off was nice, and uh, had a full practice today with under center snaps, so I felt good. Okay. Aaron, I understand you're enjoying this topic immensely. Um, but well, I, I don't mind. It's just, I mean, I felt like we were past that first part. Yeah, but you never actually told us it was broken, right, like publicly. So I, I, didn't make you, a difference. It doesn't? It doesn't make a difference with me playing, you know. It doesn't make a difference. You right. saw the tape on my thumb. didn't make a difference. So I'm wondering, though, like you said to Pat yesterday that people get all excited. You, two throws that you make 99 times out of 100. Do you make them 100 out of 100 if you're not playing with a broken thumb? No, I don't think so. So you're, I just you're think there's, there's one in every 100 that uh, doesn't come off the right way. So the throw to, to Allen, which obviously was a crucial throw in that game that you don't miss, and it sure looked to me like Allen was surprised that it wasn't on target, that he didn't even react necessarily, right? You're telling me that that has nothing to do with your thumb, that just was a crummy throw by you? Yeah. Saying that because you don't want to use it as an excuse, or because that's the truth. I think that's the truth. Yeah, I really do. I think it's the truth. Um, you know, my thumb was hurting a lot worse than the Dallas game, and I put the ball where I wanted to. Uh, well, why? How is that possible? That's a good question. Thank you. You don't have an answer. <laughs> I don't have a great answer for you. Okay. Pre down. I mean, how much? How much, if at all, was it impacting you for pre Dallas game between the Giants game, the Dallas game, those other games? Yeah, more during the week. You know, I. Did, I didn't take a lot of under center snaps during the week, the weeks leading up to it. But it's about the same every week. It didn't really get any better. Uh, it didn't get significantly worse. Um, there'd be a couple of plays every game, maybe a snap slightly inside or uh, a hit that might uh, jolt it a little bit. But you know, I was just dealing with the uh, occasional uh, kind of dull pain and and uh, working through it. Is that, is that at least a reason why you've done so much shotgun other than under center? I don't think so. Okay. No, because I told them, I said, don't want anything back. Like, let's go under center. Um, I'll be fine on Sundays. But this is the best it's felt since before the Giants game. Yes. You got a good look at Chauncey when the Saints were here during training camp. What has he been, been able to do since being with Philadelphia? Well, he moved positions. He's playing safety now. Uh, you know, he's still doing a lot of things that he's been doing in the league. He tackles well. Uh, covers well, but more vision to the football with the pass rush and vision to the football. He's had more opportunities down the field, 
and uh, he's got good hands, made the most of his uh, chances down the field. What's the key for the, the offense as a whole, Aaron, to deal with this pass rush that the Eagles are bring Sunday? Yeah, I mean, it's, it starts up front in the run game and in the, in the uh, protection. Uh, they got a lot of good pass rushers, guys inside and outside who can get after you. I got to deal the ball on time. We got to get open. And uh, we got to keep my balance, moving the pocket, and obviously mixing in uh, in runs in the shotgun. Where does this place rank in toughest places to play in your NFL experience? It's top 32 for sure. <laughs> 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 it's uh, it's a great great trash talking venue. Um, way back to when I was a young player, sitting on the bench and getting yelled at by a fan. Uh, to get the splinters out of my behind uh, the entire game. Uh, it's a real good, uh, you know, it's a great sports town. Real good uh, fans in all the sports, uh, all their different teams have great followings. And, uh, you know, it's a tough place to play. We've won there, you know, multiple times. And we got to go and do it again. Aaron, you guys defensively have coached this week at the fields on deck. Two guys that make a lot of plays with their legs, which is obviously something you know about. Is there any way for a quarterback to defend defenders with the sliding rules, or is that does the play just happen so fast that you don't really have time to take that consideration? I mean, I don't think I do, but some of these faster guys probably got a chance to do that. Um, I remember a play from college. Was it last season, the season before, where a guy kind of fake slid and kept it going, and ran for a touchdown. Um, you know, they they, uh, they police the hits on the quarterback on slides pretty well. Uh, some guys are late sliders. I happen to be more of a, I feel like, on time or early slider because I know I'm not trying to take any of those shots when you're exposed like that. But, uh, you know, Hurts doesn't slide a whole lot. You know, he, he slides when he has to, but he's, he's also a really strong and powerful runner with the football, and he's got great speed too. How did you learn how to slide? Was that something that came baseball. natural for you? Baseball. Baseball. <laughs> Played a lot of baseball. I wasn't allowed to head first slide until, uh, until I was in uh, Babe Ruth, 13-year-old baseball. So a lot of feet first slides. And also got to watch one of the worst sliders of all time, Matt Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> you guys remember some of his, his double, double knee slides. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we used to go out on the slip and slide when we were kids and learn how to slide. And so baseball. So there's definitely a right way to do it or wrong way to do it. I mean, I think if you're a baseball player, you can usually tell who those guys are when they slide. Matt, I guess, wasn't really a baseball player. You've been fun, Aaron. Um, between the season going the way it is, playing with an injury, obviously you wouldn't be here if it wasn't fun. Are you having are you having fun at all? I am having fun. I mean, I love I love these guys. It's tough, you know. Obviously, you'd love to be uh, sitting here with a better record, but I, I still love this game. I love the guys. Love the uh, stuff we get to do outside the facility. And we still try to find make ways to make it fun, you know, with the pranks and jokes and and the, the normal things that uh, keep you stimulated during the day. But uh, yeah, as a competitor, you're frustrated. But uh, this is uh, this is life in the NFL. There's a lot of ups and downs, and you can't just be happy when it's going great and you're soaring high, and you know, pissed off when it's going low. I mean, as a competitor, you want to win, but uh, you got to enjoy this thing. Otherwise, it's time to move on. Are you, after last Thursday night, did you think about this this weekend? You got any examples of what you call it, independent contractors around here? And if that's going on, it's being addressed? I haven't seen any of that. Yeah. A few weeks ago, you mentioned Dallin and Mercedes kind of stepping up in the room after a loss and talking during this tough skid, whether that's after a game or midweek. Have you gotten up in front of the room and talked to the guys? I always talk to the guys. You know, we, we have. Uh, a lot of opportunities to speak up for me in the, the meeting rooms, and and I always speak to the team before the games. Uh, so yeah, a lot of opportunities. Uh, there's you know there's it's sports. There's three or four breakdowns every day. So you pick and choose. You don't always want to be the one speaking. I think uh, you know a lot of wisdom and leadership is knowing when to be quiet sometimes and let other people speak up. But uh, I take advantage of every opportunity that I feel in the moment it's necessary for the guys to hear my voice. Not to be the guy that keeps asking about 16, but six games to go that year going to Philly. Well, six games left this year, and 10 and 7 probably get you in. Does it feel similar at all? I hope so. I hope so. We had uh, a good stretch there. We played some good football teams and some division, division opponents as well and got on a hot streak on offense. 
Now that Philly team, I believe, was five and five. Uh, not uh, what are they? Nine and one. Nine and one. Um, so a little bit stiffer challenge uh, in 2022 than 2016. The Colts played them pretty close for three and a half quarters. I mean, have you seen any opportunities from what Matt was able to do in that game against them? I mean, I feel like they ran the ball pretty well. Their defense played great. Uh, they forced turnovers uh, on the plus side of the field. Uh, you know, they, they came out of the second half and got the ball on the 30, I think, and then later Philly was driving and they forced a fumble. Um, you know, they just didn't cash in on the red zone opportunity, first and goal on the four to kind of put the game away with five minutes left. And you know, playing a really good football team, you got to do that. So if we get that opportunity, uh, you know, to play from the lead and to have a chance to put them away, we got to do that. Here in uh, Matt LaFleur said that the Eagles have great players playing at great levels. How much is, is that a factor, just guys playing at a certain level beyond expectation or, or beneath expectation in team success? Yeah, I mean, I think if you see that every single year. You see guys playing at their potential, above their potential, and sometimes below their potential. So, um, you know, confidence is really an interesting thing. Um, there's obviously a lot of other factors. There's some off-the-field factors. There's contract stuff that plays in probably in certain people's heads. But it comes down to confidence when you step between the white lines. And, um, you know, I think this team has uh, a lot of potential when we play with a lot of confidence. And you're seeing certain guys start to step up. I mean, Christian's had two really good weeks. Um, I feel like Elton has played better the last few weeks. He's feeling more confident. Um, Dave, I think, has enjoyed the five days off. And he you know, looks to be a little healthier this week. So you just got to put it all together and play with a lot of confidence and, and play loose uh, on Sunday. You've been in this league for many years and gone through the ups and downs. For the new guys, how do you instill that confidence in them when times do get tough? Uh, I, mean, I think you got to just be the same guy every day. You know, they're looking around at the NFL and they're having a lot of moments wondering if this is what the NFL is like. And I think in those moments when I was a young player, I used to look at the older guys and see how they uh, they went about their business, see what their day to day was, if anything dropped off, uh, how their attitude was, how their approach was, uh, if they seemed as focused uh, during the, the tough weeks as the as the great weeks. So we just got to lead by example and and show up every day and uh, hold guys accountable, uh, hold yourself to a standard, and then go out and execute a practice and and uh, just keep being the same guy. You said that sometimes you let the younger guys come to you as the veteran leader in the locker room. Has anyone in this locker room come up to you in the last several weeks to kind of pick your brain about what Warren was asking? Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah, all the time. Um, but you know. Some of the players in this in this day, you have to initiate more of the conversation. So uh, I look for those guys, see if anybody's struggling, or or maybe I need to pull aside and have a conversation with. And, and I think those are really important moments as a leader to to have a pulse of the locker room and see where guys are at. And and if somebody needs a, a word uh, that feels authentic in the moment, then then share that with them. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of guys who I young guys who I talk to on a daily basis and. And, and then some of the older guys too. You know, I'm always talking with Rich about special teams and seeing if there's anything he needs from me uh, to help motivate those guys. Talking with Joe and the defensive guys uh, daily. You know, Preston and I have a real good relationship, and we're always talking about the pulse of the defense. And you know, offensively, Big Dog and I, you know, kind of always uh, making sure we uh, have a good feel for where everybody's at, confidence-wise, and approach, and focus, and discipline. And it's important to have in those, uh, those conversations each week. And speaking of that, I'm assuming you actually believe when you said that you guys can win out on yeah. Thursday. Yeah. Do you have a sense of whether the guys you need to believe that in this locker room actually believe it and not just you know, scoff at something like that because of how you guys have played this year? I, don't, I honestly don't think it matters. Matt. I really don't. I think when you win, uh, it creates a momentum. When I said it in 2016, uh, how many people actually believe then? Probably not many. But then we got the first one. And we came home and got the second one. And we beat Seattle, got the third one. And I think uh, there was a lot of momentum that started in the locker room and guys started realizing this was a possibility. And it was like a snowball effect rolling downhill. So we gotta, we gotta pack that snowball this week and get it to the top of the hill and let it start rolling downhill. What about personally, Aaron? Has self-doubt ever creeped in? And if it has after games, 
what do you turn to? Where's your belief? Is it just the, your great play over the course of time? Where does that come from for you? Uh, scotch. <laughs> Definitely a lot of scotch. Uh, reflection is an important part of this game. And I think you always got to separate the emotion uh, from the reality. And so after every game, win or lose, there's an important reflection period that happens. And I joke about scotch, but often it, it is with a, a glass of scotch uh, as I contemplate how the game went, what I could have done better, uh, what I need to do differently in the upcoming weeks. But there's a lot of confidence built up over the years um, about uh, the way I've played. And that's what I lean on when it's hard times and even when it's good times. It's a reminder that I've done it before and, and I'm going to do it again. Is keeping that reflection positive important? Because there are people that reflect and then just kind of get down on their own thoughts. How important is the positive reflection part of that brief? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know anybody who does that who has competitive greatness. Because uh, competitive greatness know, is the knowing that uh, sometimes your best is not going to be good enough on that day. But the most important thing is how you prepared and how you focused and how you went out and played and the effort and the energy you brought to that moment. Um, so I don't know any negative person who has competitive greatness. You said you reflect back on having done it before. This week, do you reflect back on times like 2016? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I remember how that game started. You know, we, we took the ball and we went down and scored. And then we got the ball back and scored again. It's 14 nothing, And the whole field changed. And again, that wasn't a 9-1 and one football team, but that was still a team that was in it, 5-5 uh, five and five in the playoff hunt. Had a young quarterback who was playing at a high level, and it just changed a lot of the energy uh, in the, on the sideline for us. So that's what we need first. We need an energy shift and then a belief to kick in, and then us to play four quarters and finish the game out. And, you know, get one in the bag and, and get the, then get the next five. Wanting to play, wanting to play from ahead. Uh, was there a strategy then? Like normally, the rule is to defer if you win the toss. Mm -hmm. Do you you know tell the captains like, hey, we want the ball first if we win tonight? Maybe we did it in sixteen. Some flexibility with the 17 games to go on runs, to have a slump, and be able to recover. Does this feel like your last stand? Is it just the math? You know, that tennis, I mean, that you're in that time zone a lot different. I don't think so. I don't. Um, you know, I feel confident we're going to go out and play well. Uh, but I don't think this is the last stand. Aaron, two more for him after the game when we talked about going up tempo. Um, if you're trying to, I don't know if you have to convince Matt or that's something that he likes, but if you're trying to convince him, what are the pros that you're telling him are the upside of it and what are the challenges that you have to kind of acknowledge might make it difficult? I don't know about challenges. I don't think there's a lot of challenges. If you, anything that you work on and emphasize, uh, the results are going to follow. Um, you know, I think you look at the, some of the stagnation we've had on offense uh, over the season a lot of times what's brought us out is some of those up-tempo drives so um, we'll see what happens this week and it's not something that like when you did it with tay and jordy and randall well obviously that was easier yeah because those guys can play every position but you get what you emphasize and if you emphasize some of that stuff you're going to be more prepared for it